hello everyone, and welcome to Mitchell Giddings Fine Arts. Thank you for being here tonight to share in this special presentation. And I also would like to thank Vermont Arts Council and the Vermont Arts Council calendar, where we share space and a link. Um, and tonight's videographer, Maria, is here, and the Brattleboro Community Television, and Andy Reichsman and Kate Purdy of Ames Hill Film and Video Productions for the filming and editing of our artist talks and special events. So tonight is special as we welcome this selection of eight artists from ZMAs, four of whom are here tonight. ZMA's printmaking studio and gallery located in Florence, Massachusetts. ZMA's means sweet corn, a plant with the ability to extract toxins from the soil. ZMA's printmaking is a professional studio, gallery, and research center and educational facility dedicated to safe and sustainable printmaking practices. Our exhibit, Voices, features work by printmakers Judith Bowerman, Lyle Kassengway, Liz Schalfen, Sarah Creighton, Anita Hunt, Lynn Petterfront, Eric Radich, Erica Radich, excuse me, and Joyce Silverstone. Multiple printmaking techniques utilized by the artists include monotype, collagraph, dry point etching, and woodcut. Please help me welcome the artists here tonight from ZMAs. Now, as far as the uh, format, um, Petey and I will uh, ask a few leading questions, and we hope that in the, as we do that, people from the audience can uh, ask their own questions as well. And uh, perhaps as we go around, the artists, as they're asked questions, can introduce themselves. And one thing that we'll have to do, just because of the setup tonight, this, we're not used to using a microphone, is uh, we will repeat your questions into the microphone rather than passing the mic around. So if you ask, why am I here, I will repeat, why am I here? <laughs> and we'll go from there. Thank you. So I think I'll start off with an observation made by a painter as opposed to a printmaker. And this is probably answerable by all of you, uh, so I'll just ask in general. Speaking as a non-painter, uh, I'm sorry, speaking as a non-printer, one of the fascinating aspects of printmaking is the paradox that in creating an image to be printed, as a last step, artists take the transfer or application of the ink or paint out of their fingers and trust the image to be magically completed by pressing the ink onto a piece of paper out of sight where no la last minute brush strokes or fingers can help. And it's a paradox, it's also the beauty of printmaking in my, eyed, my eyes that there's a surprise, there are things happening out of your control. But as a painter, I like to have that last say. So perhaps you could uh, begin by letting us know what is it in printmaking that excites you or that leads you to use the process of using a print and um, a, a plate and a press rather than controlling it with your fingers and paint brushes. Erica? I, oh, the microphone. Um, I think inviting the unknown to work with you in your studio is primarily what makes printmaking interesting to me. Um, I love the idea of preparing parts of a work and doing all the choices and making all the decisions you can and then letting something else apply itself to my work. I just love that. And also the repetition. There's something really meditative and a quality of rhythm that I get from printmaking that doesn't happen in other mediums. You mentioned control. You like to have the last bit of control. And I would say I'm a painter as well, although I've been doing mainly printmaking for the last, I don't know, eight years or so. Um, that element of control sometimes is the problem. You know, it becomes too familiar. You go, you go back on habits 
or um, it gets stale. And with printmaking, there is that discovery. Uh, it's things that you, you can plan and you can anticipate what you're going to get, but then there is always a surprise. And that's what charges me up with printmaking, uh, very much so. Uh, I'm Joyce Silverstone, and um, I, yes to <laughs> you know all of that. Um, I feel like I employ um, surprise, you know, for myself. Uh, keeps me active and and just kind of following along, like what is going to happen when that pressure hits that ink, you know, it's very unpredictable. And I feel like that's often exactly where the images come from. You know, they come from that alchemy. In recent images I've been exploring, like how does water <laughs> actually pick up the ink? And it wouldn't do anything without running it through a whole lot of pressure. Um, I guess I feel like every discovery is important because of the printmaking. It, it, it comes, it's sort of why I do it. Um, and fortunately, you know, it's, um, I don't know if you can see it around the room, but we're all involved, I think, in that uh, element of you know, how can these marks be as fresh as possible? And I think that's a, it's a challenge. Yeah. 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 I'm Liz Chalfin, and I think um, for me, I really depend on the, um, the process. Um, I think it loosens me up in a way where if I was working directly on a piece of paper, I would be tighter. So that transfer somehow loosens me up. Um, like everyone has said that the unknown, uh, what happens that you don't expect can be really uh, exciting and invigorating and move you to the next step. I also really like um, trying to embrace the um, mistakes or the failures or the unexpected things that happen and I think that it's kind of a metaphor for life in a way where you know you take what comes along and you work with it and you make it work for you and so uh, that whole aspect of printmaking kind of speaks to me as well. I have one more thing to add to that. The other thing that happens with printmaking, which is, well, particularly monoprinting, which is quite different from painting, at least the way I approach painting, is that something may happen and you don't like it. And you have the opportunity to run it through a press again with something else on it. Or you're just making other ones. You know, you have this chance to do a lot of variations on a theme in a way that um, frees, I think that's part of the freeing up. Whereas a painting, when I'm working on a painting, which has been a struggle for me lately, um, you know, I will kind of, if I don't like something, I guess I deal with it like I deal with printing. I cover it up. <laughs> you know, I do another painting on top of it. and. Um, but you lose all those other things. You don't see them side by side, which, you, which happens in printmaking. I, in response to that, I think there's something great about the way printmaking documents the history of the process. And you get that um, you can either take prints at various stages of the development, so you have a record of where a piece was at certain points, but there's also kind of the history on the plate. I do more etching and intaglio work, and that is et literally, it's etched, the history's etched into the plate, and you could scrape away and remove it, but there's some echo of it there. And I love that aspect of seeing the process uh, visibly in the work. I, th 
think Petey had some questions, and uh, unless there's something from the audience, I'd love to hear people interrupt us at any point along the way. Um, so. so many questions. <laughs> Hi, guys. I'm so glad you're here. Um, I start with simple questions. Is what inspires your work, your imagery? That's important. <laughs> <laughs> Someone else wants to start. <laughs> Um, I really usually start with an idea, and I get the ideas from reading or from the New York Times, or, and sometimes I find something that really moves me, and I want to know more about it, I want to explore it, I want to fragment it, I want to print it, <laughs> and so I use it as inspiration, and um, it can be something that I work on for eight months, but it's just a subject that feels close to my heart and then I do things with it. I find images and then I go into the studio and I tear them into pieces and I try to find different processes that will work with the subject that I've chosen. And um, I taught myself a few new processes just because I wanted to depict um, plankton blooms, for instance, you know, or sort of these feathery little coastal beautiful colored things, and I found powders that work, but I tried all different kinds of salts for a while. And that, that's another beautiful part about printmaking. The materials that we are we can use are just, I mean, they're just, there are, there's no end to how many materials we can use and access and employ in our work. But I just love to start pretty much with an idea and then work from there. I'm not sure I'm ready to speak. Are you? I'm still <laughs> formulating how to start. <laughs> I'll, I'll talk. Okay, no, no, it's fine. I, I, you know, I, it's a little um, direct, and I feel like the way that I actually come to my work is pretty indirect. You know, it's... it's um, what I can catch out of the corner of my eye kind of thing. So that becomes um, you know, the question, like, well, what was that little movement? And how can I be part of that movement? And I think what happens when I'm working actually is as I'm working, I notice that, oh, this has something to do with how I feel. And, you know, j just because we had this conversation about, uh, oh, there, in these pieces that I'm showing, there's like a, there's a, a one side that's meeting another side kind of um, edge to the work. Um, and I feel like that has a lot to do with how, you know, how it is to be in the world where this part of myself is maybe meeting something that isn't exactly like me. <laughs> and there's an edge there. And how would I describe, <clears throat> you know, how would I describe how that feels? So I, I go pretty roundabout in order to see through the process of working, oh, that's what I'm actually thinking about. And, and then maybe a series would develop out of that. But. I, I don't know if I can articulate all of this, but the thing that um, has astounded me, I think maybe particularly more so lately, is looking back and seeing the different images that I have worked with over time and how that those images have formed a visual language. And with each kind of passage of um, time and different focus or content in the work, that they, it's like uh, rearranging the sentence. Mm -hmm. And um, 
and they have a different context. Uh, to use an example, one recurring image that um, has been in my work from you know, when I was you know, in my 20s was the notion of a knot. And that first came from an image in a, a kind of, a, well, it was a writing workshop and doing some twilight imagery. And I had this vision of one of those plated red Chinese, you know, interwoven knot. And that just, that image just really held on for a long time. And it's like, at, because it's so, it was so present, you go, well, why? What's going on? <laughs> why is this here? And um, it's interesting when you pose questions to yourself, what begins to, to surface? And um, you know the idea of interconnectedness. Sometimes the idea that you know it's a little too tight. <laughs> and um, so that knot has evolved from dealing with kind of Celtic knot work to um, nautical knots, and seeing the kind of loops that um, the different knots have, and just the number of loops became you know important in terms of. There was one knot that had three loops, and I have three daughters. <laughs> you know? So um, that was one element. And then moving into more na nature, which um, f you know, I get a lot of imagery, or things really stand out um, as I garden or whatever, um, out in you know, nature. Um, the idea of tangled knots, and maybe the notion of persistent vine, and um, and then as you know, most recently, brain tangles and um, all that that kind of implies as well. So you know that has like what is that thirty five years, where that one element has come in and out of the work. Uh, I think for me, um, my work comes from my personal experiences out in the world. I'm very interested in um, kind of uh, recording an experience of a place and an interaction with that place, whether, um, and it's usually as an observer as opposed to a, a participant. So um, I take a lot of photographs when I'm out in public places, museums, um, fairs, parades, you know, the street, and um, those are the things that interest me in retelling those stories of those experiences of being in those places. But as I'm working with that imagery, I find that it's, my work is less about that particular place or that experience and more about how we construct a memory of an experience. So then I get involved with thinking about things like, you know, when you're, reconstructing something that happened in the past, how do we change those personal stories? How does that get rewritten and retold? What do we leave behind? What do we bring forward? What gets diminished and washed away? What gets emphasized? And those then start to become the issues that I think about. Um, in the little collages that I have on the wall over there, those um, came from a, a, a subconscious place where I was not telling a real story or recounting a real experience, but was using old material, recycling old etchings into new images and trying not to have a conscious idea in mind, but just let my subconscious construct these things and then the stories kind of came after. I just want to say that it is such a luxury. I feel so lucky to be able to be expressing things that mean a lot to me in this visual way. And we're just so lucky because that's our job to do. And I just feel so fortunate. So I have a question for Liz. Um, in your little pieces, you talk about um, leaving things behind, telling a story that um, changes. And 
at least two of those have a character in front of another uh, larger image of a character, either a shadow or another person. But it's not a shadow, it's not a repeated shape. And I found that fascinating, especially in the context of what you just talked about and what I see in your large piece, Woman in Ruins, the idea that um, perhaps that is a shadow, but it's a shadow uh, from another moment. And I'm also interested that you create that. Um, I'm not quite sure of my question at this point. It seems like you talk about it like there's an intention, but it almost feels like it just happened circumstantially. And so that's an observation. I don't know if you have a comment on that. But it's a beautiful side of those, those two or three prints that have the repeated image, which isn't quite the same, one to the other. Um, I think of it both as like a foreshadowing of perhaps something that could happen or could be the future or the past or some other influential character shadowing over the protagonist in the little mini story. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a device that I think for me kind of implies time in a way, um, whether it's the past or the future. Um, I oftentimes think that at the very base of making art is, or my desire to make art is just making sense, you know, and when you're talking about projecting or foreshadowing, oftentimes the work, you know, I'm working within a certain realm or certain interest at a particular time, but the work oftentimes knows something way before I know it, and it is informing me, which seems kind of weird, <laughs> but it does. Um, you know, it, and I think a lot of it is that unconscious part of, of working. Are there any printmakers in the audience um, who have questions uh, or whose approach or observations might be a little bit uh, different or that can add to this conversation. I find it fascinating, just uh, again, from the perspective of being a painter and not being familiar with techniques. I'm learning a lot, but um, I still have the desire to just be pushing around that one last little stroke. <laughs> and I've been totally dissed by the um, printmakers up here. Um, my inability to uh, leave the control behind, but um, maybe somebody else uh, has some observations. Are there other printmakers here? <laughs> Are there any painters here? <laughs> so, you talk about your creative process of what, you know, if, Erica, if you're layering things and you're thinking about what you're reading and events and then layering that in your work and if you come at it as a printmaker and you're a monotype and you do public spaces but there's printmaking involves so much other kinds of preparation and getting everything together and for your timeline of how you do things is there some kind of creative to get to that place in your mind that creative place in your mind how do you allow what what do you do specifically that's going to help you with your creative process. And it could be if you're a writer, like I wake up every morning at 6, and that's my alone time for two hours, or I have to be in this room and the light has to be just so, or is there something that you know that you do that gets you to that place that you need to be in your mind to open up those creative doors? I love that question. And, um, and I, I teach a lot, and I teach a lot at the studio. Um, and one of the first things that I usually do, whether we're making, um, you know, learning how to make collagraph plates, or if we're learning how to make a dry point print, you know, different techniques, 
I always have people start by making transfer drawings. Um, and that's what I do in my studio. And it is the most simple printmaking technique. And I, I was told when I was a student, <laughs> I was 20, by my painting teacher that I should make a hundred transfer drawings in a week. So she was, she was clearly, you know, trying to get me to move, you know, to like, okay, let's, <laughs> let's move this along, you know, and see what happens if you, um, if you just put ink on a piece of glass and you put a thin paper over the top of it and draw on the back. Um, what happens when your touch gets recorded and actually your attention to whatever it is that you're looking at gets recorded? Um, there's always a surprise in that. And there's always, you know, the quickness of it. Like I start a class and I say, these are going to be two minute drawings. You know, we're just going to go through it. And I'm going to tell you exactly the prompt. You know, use your elbow to do this one. You know, change your tool. Um, use what you're looking, look, you, you know, use the natural object that you're looking at to actually make the marks now. You know, just really simple prompts. But in that process, I do that when I'm starting in my studio and I haven't been there for a while or I'm uh, engaged in a process that's been just kind of technical printing for a while. I go back to drawing. And I go back to exactly that kind of drawing because it gets me out of it a little bit where I can't see what I'm drawing, which is that wonderful print, print thing where you can't evaluate it. Um, and what you're getting is you're getting this, the sort of freshest possible um, rec record of the moment. And you know, just put that down, make another one, put it down, make another one. And then we start making plates based on those drawings. Because, you know, new ways of working in the studio, we're not working on copper necessarily, we're working on clear plastic plates. And we can put those right on top of those transfer drawings and get the kind of fresh mark that's right there onto the plate. And then from there you can kind of start developing your, your, wherever you resonate with that image um, as it starts, as you get familiar with it. So that's one way. <laughs> Thanks for asking. This kind of answers both your question and one of yours, Jim. Um, you know, for me, one of the things that I really like about printmaking is that I do have control in um, many points in the process. And I love that, that um, there's all these, you know, there's a lot of technical stuff that I do. And in etching and in working with photopolymer plates and things, there's just basic kind of work that you have to do. You put a, a coating on a plate to prevent protect it from an acid. You put, uh, you do work in Photoshop to manipulate an image. There's kind of these technical steps along the way. And at every step of the way, there's a point where you can intervene and make aesthetic decisions. And so even if it's, you know, as simple as, um, you know, putting a ground on a plate, you can make a choice to put it on smoothly, to put it on roughly, to leave open spaces and let chance be involved. So I love that at, I have control at all those points to make these decisions as an artist. Um, it also kind of breaks up the practice in a way where I can do it in manageable chunks, like today I'm gonna prep plates, today I'm gonna draw on plates, another day I'll do this, and it works in 
a busy lifestyle to kind of have these discrete places to be creative. But for me, I found the last few years I've been able to go away on a residency for a few weeks um, each year, and that's the point where I really get to dig in. And for me, that's become a vital uh, part of figuring out what my work is going to be. And then coming back to the studio and the how to make that, really realize that becomes the task for the rest of the year. And I could do that in, the, in these manageable chunks. But the real deep thinking and feeling and being involved with the idea happens when I could really isolate myself. You read about writers who have that practice. They get up early. They you spend three hours in you know writing, even if they're rewriting the sentence over and over and again. Um, I sometimes I think I should be more disciplined, <laughs> but um, I could never get into anything like that because for me, once you start forcing something, it just kills it, and so. The things that become important or that end up in my work occur in very weird, different ways. You know, it might be in the garden, and I just see a particular bud, which somehow is a metaphor for, you know, either, either the bud is opening up or it's, you know, starting to die, which has, like, life stages that seem to be important at the time. Um, I do a lot of reading, and sometimes you just encounter a passage that just all of a sudden pulls a number of things together that, you know, just have a lot of significance. Um, as an example, I uh, was reading Robin Wall Kimmerer's book called Braiding Sweetgrass, and in it she talks about cleaning out a pond and... Um, pulling up this algae. Now, she is a, a botanist and you know, scientist, and she could identify that algae as a net algae. And then she started talking about how um, when things you know, are fine, that algae just stays by itself. But when going gets rough, it invites the, the hyphae or the fungus in. I'm not sure what that does scientifically, but you know, when the going gets tough, then it's the community that really makes a difference. And that idea of you know, that natural element, the net, has transferred into really focusing in on safety net our you know, social safety net and the experience that um, you know, family members have with not, you know, where it's not working for you, what you read in the paper, uh, it, you know, just currently, it, it's crazy. So it's, it's weird how you know, things become prominent or why, am I, why did I find this now? Uh, one thing I used to do, and <laughs> it may sound also kind of nuts, um, we used to live in Springfield, and they had, they used to have a phenomenal library. And, and their art and music section was just wonderful to go and spend time in. And I would go up and down the aisles, and I would just randomly pull out a book that just caught my eye and open it up and, you know, often, not oftentimes, but... Um, something would make itself known. Uh, one time I opened up a book and there was the image of the Fibonacci spiral. And <laughs> that just took off and became a whole series of works um, based on that, um, you know, that golden mean and just that element that um, played, came back into play when I was, you know, pregnant. And, that whole notion of life and continuation, <laughs> things like that. Uh, hi, sorry. Um, I, have, I have, as Liz was saying, it, it loosens her up to do printmaking. Well, I need a lot of loosening up to, to get to work. <laughs> I'm really very sort of 
energetic. And um, so I need music. It's really important what music is playing for me. And then I also uh, spend a lot of time with ideas that um, then I anthrop anthropomorphize. Like, for an example, is I was working with mycorrhizal fungi for a while, and, and I learned that all the trees and plants on this earth, 85 or 90 percent, are connected under the earth. And so I started thinking of lines and how these, there's beautiful networks under the earth. And then the next thing I sometimes do is just just free associate words. I just list words, and then one of them will be important to me, and I'll use it in my work. And the other thing is when I get really um, tight, I breathe. I just go to my breath. And that, for me, has become a huge um, useful tool to feel more relaxed and be able to access some deeper feelings and understandings that I've been looking for or haven't been accessible to me before. So those are some ways. And but loosening up, I, when Joyce was talking, I can really relate to, to that wonderful way that she does in her classes. It, it's a great way. And gesture drawing used to be that for me when we did drawings and figure drawings late in earlier life. They would, we would just do a lot of gesture drawings and then we could do our drawings. So I think all of those things, just anything to relax, I think, to relax and to feel more in touch with yourself, myself. I'll just I'll just make a, a plug for uh, ZMA's printmaking <laughs> because just circling back to there's a room at ZMA's that Liz has included in um, a very busy studio. Uh, it's the annex, and the annex is a an individual. Um, private, um, you can close the door and you are there with a beautiful press and lovely table space and, um, and that feeling of retreat and be, being just stepping out um, <laughs> is provided there uh, and it's been it's been so valuable for me. It's when I can um, do a lot of looking. Um, I can do printing until I can't print any longer because it's you know it's 24-hour access, and I, I know it's been important for a lot of artists. Um, and to have that worked into you know, the space where every space is like used for, you know, just every tool is, uh, everything's accounted for. To have that um, as, you know, just sacred space for, for people to set aside, it's, it's, it's a great resource. Yeah. I, yeah. Did you want to say something? Or you may think that, but because we're telling you how we work and where we get our ideas, that um, things are like crystal clear. And when you started talking about being able to work for an extended time, you know, I was reminded how when I have extended time like that, where there's no interruptions, no phone calls, no, but you know, the washing machine hasn't stopped and I need to put into the dryer. Um, the, the little impulses which really informs you um, is, are allowed to bubble up and to hold on to. You know, it doesn't become just this fleeting thing that is gone. Um, so th that triggered that thought. I wanted to say one quick thing, just the simple act of going to ZMAs and knowing that you're in the studio for eight hours and that's what you're doing and there is no washing machine or a telephone. And that's a wonderful way for me to focus, just so we're lucky we have ZMAs. <laughs> True that. Yes. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about ZMAs. Um, the printmaking studio, the facility, because 
uh, it sounds really exceptionally um, successful in that it brings so much, uh, so much, to, to so much out of the different artists. It brings so many artists there. How many people work there? Are you members? Uh, do you have classes? Do you have studios? Do you have exhibitions? Um, just let some of the people know what, what the story is. Um, so, ZMAs was founded in 2000, so we're hitting our 19th year, and we're in our third space. So the space we're in now is a 6,000 square foot building, um, two floors. Uh, downstairs we have what we call the teaching studio, it has three etching presses. The annex, which is a private studio with our largest etching press. A dark room for photopolymer work, a small gallery a silk screen area with a little screen printing dark room. And then upstairs we have our member studio, which has uh, three etching presses and a small letter press set up. We offer classes throughout the year, over 30 workshops throughout the year, anywhere from a one-day workshop to a three-week intensive. And they range in all printmaking processes except for traditional lithography. Um, the focus of the studio is on safer and non-toxic practices, so we have a very active research program, that, and the research is done by interns who are usually post-grad students who come to the studio for six months, and they do a project, and then they assist with the workshops. Um, we have over 100 members. I would say... Um, we have different levels of membership that gives you different access amounts of time in the studio. Um, about half of those members are active members who are at the studio at least once a month. Um, so it's a great community. We have a very active and great exhibition committee that um, researches opportunities for exhibitions. We plan group exhibitions. We invite curators in. We were so fortunate that uh, PD came down to the studio, used the flat file, which is a great resource we have there to identify artists and select the artists for this exhibition. And um, we've had that experience with several other curators from different galleries around the region. So we're, part of our mission is to share um, the work to demonstrate that you don't have to sacrifice quality to work safer and in less toxic toxic practices. So that's why we're really focused on getting the work out there. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot right there. Uh, and there is more. Uh, just in terms of, um, you know, I became a member uh, and just was, you yeah, know, just casting about to see where I could work. And I came really as a, as a painter. <laughs> I didn't really know anything about printing. Um, and, you know, the, the atmosphere in the studio is one of, you know, just how do you do that? Um, can you show me how you did that? Um, is there something, you know, the question arises, you know, is there some way that I can use that? technical practice to further what I'm doing. Um, you know, introduction to, to techniques are happening all the time. You know, what paper are you printing on? What, um, and, and behind that question is all these answers. You know, it's like, oh my gosh. You know, there, you feel like you're, you've got wind in your sails because you're surrounded by people who are, who are you know, generous and using um, innovative techniques. And I, and I think because they're innovative, um, they're fresh, they're better. You know, they're better than what you would be doing if you were just kind of doing something automatically. Um, you know, we don't do lithography, but, you know, this blueprint over there that I have is, you know, a form of lithography that's done on wood. And we had a person who was in using the annex and 
doing her personal work and she did a demo on wood lithography and I just went like you're kidding you can get wood grain and image at the same time you know that's magic so you know I kind of like played around with it um and I feel like that's that happens so much there it's really fun um one of the programs that you know you didn't mention, but I'm very part of, and I, I'm so glad, is there's a mentorship program. So people who are interested in printmaking but don't want to go back to school or um, have an idea for a project, but they really need technical help, um, there are various forms of becoming um, mentored by people who are yeah just so knowledgeable composition and um, how to take an image and make it communicate stronger you know just all plus all the techn technical stuff that um, you know you're not you're not even being mentored by one individual person. You're really being mentored by the whole faculty. You have access to the whole faculty. So that's just an amazing program. Uh, yeah. Well, you didn't mention residency. <laughs> um, and people have come from all over the place, from Europe, from Australia. I mean, it's it's amazing how people find out about you. You have quite a name now, and um, so that that is one part I just wanted to mention as well. Um, and I lost what I was going to say. Um, it, it'll come back to me. <laughs> I I also love the multi generational aspect of ZMAs. There are some really young people and some really old people and and it's just a wonderful place for everybody to have on the same playing field just really in enjoying each other I learned so much from the younger people I just am so lucky I feel to be able to be with them a lot and um, and also the internet I, I was thinking of the residencies these you get to learn so much about other countries and and exchanges, and everyone's really so liberal and generous with ideas. I just love, you just by osmosis learn so much just by working next to somebody, even if you don't interact. And sitting so. down for lunch. <laughs> and lunch, that's a great part. Um, I just wanted to say how impressed I am with Liz and how she has planned uh, this place. Um, Oftentimes when I'm telling people ask questions about ZMAs and I'm trying to explain about it, first of all, I say, well, Liz walks on water, <laughs> for one. Um, the, a little while ago, I think it was maybe a year or so ago, we uh, sit, having lunch, sitting around the big table, and I asked Liz, did you know when you started almost 19 years ago that this is where you would be? She started with just one press, a relatively small studio, um, which I was wonderful, or I was so glad that you know she had that because previously I was driving into Somerville in order to be able to print, and you know it was just a few people that you would encounter, and um, it was very simple. And then slowly she started adding all these different things that you just heard about. And so when I asked her, did you know that you would be here 19 years ago? And she said, yes. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> uh, she, and uh, you can explain it, but she said that she had done a lot of planning and writing and working with somebody that helped with guiding questions. So. It's amazing. <laughs> well, I'll just I'll just briefly talk uh, about um, the uh, original that writing process. I was really fortunate to work with a person called a vision manager, and I think nowadays they'd be called a life coach. But twenty some odd years ago, they, he was called a vision manager, and. Um, 
he was a guy who helped like corporations kind of go through giant shifts and for pro bono work he would work with creative people and help them kind of realize ideas and uh, he worked with a friend of mine who started a, a restaurant and that's how I connected with him and the thing he asked me so I, I would go to him in um, Stockbridge was where he, his place was and I'd go to him once a week for like eight months I drove out there and he the first thing he asked me was um, to write about how I envisioned my life when I'm 80 years old and then said okay now we'll work back from there and I think that was why I could have this really big vision is because I was really projecting far into the future. At that time, I wasn't even 40 yet. So I was projecting, you know, a whole another lifetime ahead and thinking about, okay, what do I want to have accomplished in my life? What do I want my legacy to be? And that question, which I never would have asked myself, I would have started with like, okay, what's... What do you need to open a business? You know, what do you need? The practical things, but that giant vision is what really um, helped. And then after writing about that over and over for eight months, um, I had this kind of giant idea that could just hang out there. So whenever it came time to make a decision about the growth of the studio or the next choice, do I move into a larger space? Do we buy another press? Do we add this program? I could always kind of refer to this larger vision. And that was really helpful. One last chance for the audience. Yeah. So. Um, I'm not a member of the ZMA, but I have taken a class there and know a number of people who are um, affiliated with ZMA. But to me, the thing, I, I live in town, and the thing that I think about when I um, think about ZMA is that it is really, it is a sanctuary. And, um, and even when I go there just to pick someone up, um, there, there's, there's something really. Um, I, I don't know how. I don't want to sound hokey, but there's no other way to put it. It's the way that people are with each other, the way that the space is set up. Um, it really is a, a sanctuary, not only for artists, but I think for the town. And I kind of wonder how that came about, and whether that was just something that came to be from the founding members and the people that began over in Pine Street or um, how, how that came to be because it, it is a feeling that everyone in town agrees is true. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm sure there are many words that I could add that I think that I think contributes to that, but the way that um, Liz models generosity. It's exactly the word I was going to use. Yeah. It, it, it's the foundation of the place. And, and if you don't have that um, experience, you know, of of being in that kind of field uh, of generosity, um, you might question, you know, like, well, is it really, <laughs> is it really always this nice, you know? <laughs> I've heard that question. Um, and, and, I can, and I can absolutely say yes, yeah. it is, I, with always. You know, it's not infinite patience. It's, but it is always generous. So, yeah, I would have to say it really goes back to Liz. Um, I can be working downstairs, and you hear Liz's laughter throughout the entire building, <laughs> which is, you know, just this. Um, really adds an upbeat quality as well, which I think infects everybody. Um, I lost what I was, another thing I was going to say. I'll, I'll come back. <laughs> I also agree with all of that, and, but I also 
there is a sense of order um, at ZMAs that is just, it's not imposing or difficult, it just is. And for me, that just feels so calming. And, um, and it's done in such a beautiful way of not, never, you know, speaking harshly or, but there's just this wonderful organization and order that I love. And um, also, I, I, now I've forgotten what I was going to say. Um, I, I just wanted to say, oh, also, the changes that happened at CMAs, Liz has made them incrementally, but has somehow, the, I know you had the big vision and you had this goal, but the way that they happened was chosen so wisely. And they were just at the right time. and. And they worked, and nothing felt out of control or too explosive. It was always just right, and I think that's an amazing talent. I don't know how you did that. Yeah, that's, that is along the line that I wanted to add. She has so many irons in the fire at one time. It's like, how in the world does she juggle all these different things? If I you know, had that many things going, I'd be a nervous wreck. Truly. So, I mean, I think you do set the tone. Um, it centers around that, and not to put pressure on you, but um, it, it really is the, the core. I'll take the pressure off. <laughs> <laughs> I think part of the mission of the studio really is to um, make the very best work come out of the studio and there's a seriousness about what's being made it's not um you know it's not dour or anything it's not like serious it's like um each person challenges the next person to make their very best work and liz sets the tone there too um you know, not only does she direct the studio, but she's making the very best work, you know, kind of year after. The bar just keeps going up and up and up for everybody who's in the flat file and, and showing their work. And, and so I think being part of something that feels like it's growing and getting better and everyone that you're involved with um, is adding value, it's a perfect place to work, yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> that was a lot of flattery. Um, you know, I, I, I am the leader of this community, but I think that the community is what it is because of the people that are, participate and the sanctuary uh, that it is is because of the community. And um, I might set the tone, but you know we're a big choir, and everybody has a voice in it, and and it's together as a community that we make the place so special. Can I, add I just wanted to go um, back in history a little about how I met Liz, which was when you had that position at the Smith Art Museum before the renovation. Was it the education? I can't remember what your official title was. And I saw, maybe I got an email or whatever, that before the closing, there was going to be, I believe, a weekly gathering in the museum space before it was demolished, before it got rebuilt. And Liz was doing it. There was food. There were chairs. There, were, there was paper and pencils. There was music, if I remember correctly. And there'd be a, a sort of... Um, assignment isn't quite the word I want, but an idea thrown out, and we would wander the museum, put our chairs down next to a painting or a sculpture that meant something to us. And this was at something like six o'clock. I was home with young kids. And to just go in there and have you take care of everything. You were a hostess. You were, you were opening up this space. And so I guess I somehow through that heard about ZMAs, because you were already on my radar screen. And that was a lovely precursor, as I'm listening to what all of you are saying, to, to that, that you had all the different elements there. And it was a precious gift. Thank you. 
This is so much fun. <laughs> um, this has been such a wonderful process for me, meeting Liz, meeting Erica, getting to be friends with everyone, and, and the collaborative, supportive environment is like nothing I've ever seen. I mean, much better than art school, much better than art school years ago. But um, it's such a supportive environment, and I'm learning so much about about ZMA is over, I think we started even talking about it about two years ago, right? And then slowly it, it came to be. And I have to say it was really difficult to choose work because we only had this part of the gallery essentially to be able to work with. There were so many more artists that would be really neat to have involved, but having you guys part of the show is just such a treat. But the collaborative quality and supportive quality of what I'm learning about ZMAs is something that is just absolutely sublime. And you, we just applaud you, all of you guys, but you, Liz, for starting this. Um, and I, I was a printmaker about 80, 38 years ago. I set up a printmaking shop and, um, when I was not with Jim. <laughs> and um, the toxic materials that I was working with, benzene, nitric acid, was the, the death of that. Stopped and ended up just painting, but now, um, I took a mono painting uh, workshop with Lisa Mackey last week with Helen, and it was life-changing for me because now printmaking feels like a real doable, viable, exciting part of my personal creativity now. And that wouldn't be happening if it weren't for starting to steep, um, walk my toes into ZMAs and, and put the show together. So thanks. But um, so guys, something more to say. <laughs> Something more to say is the question. I, no, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I'm fine. Thank you, everybody, for being here, and especially thanks to the ZMAs folks that are here and for the institution. Thank you. Thank you.